the Household of Faith would like to invite you to worship with us. Worship services are held at the Indiana University Northwest Library Conference Center, room LC110. For more information, please visit www.israelteach.com. First, give an honor to the most high of God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's always it's a blessing. Anytime that I can share God's word, and I'm truly thankful to have an opportunity to do so. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started with today's lesson. And the title is Beware of Satan and His Evil Angels. This lesson is about Satan and his evil angels, and we're going to see what the objective is, and more importantly, how they go about carrying it out. And it's important to understand about Satan and his tactics, because as Paul said, we're in a battle, and he calls it spiritual warfare. And the reason he refers to it as a spiritual warfare is because we are at war with an enemy that we cannot even see. And in order to overcome these evil spirits, you're going to need God's spirit, which is his word. There should be a battle taking place in the deep recesses of your mind, and the battle is over who you are going to serve. Will it be Satan or will it be God? And Satan's whole objective is to get you to be disobedient to the Lord, and in doing so, cause you to lose your eternal salvation. And make no mistake, Satan and his angels are powerful beings. But as long as you hold on to your faith, as long as you remain obedient to the word of God, you don't have to worry about Satan and his angels because there is absolutely nothing that they can do unto you. We're going to see in the course of this lesson that there is an enemy trying to destroy us and that enemy is Satan and his evil angels. And we're going to see that Satan is running this world. And if you look at the condition of the world and the wickedness that is in man. It is obvious that man is being led by Satan and not by God. From the world leaders, both political and religious, to the average individual, they are all being influenced by Satan and not God. And I know that's a strong indictment, but the Bible, along with man's actions, both confirm that it is Satan that is running this world. And we're going to see that there's a battle taking place. And we're going to see what the tactics are that Satan uses. And Satan uses temptation and deceit. Satan will lie and tempt you in an effort to cause you to be disobedient to the Lord. And what he tempts you with is your own desires. And we're going to see that he uses men and random thoughts to convey his lies. And we're going to see that how you fight Satan is with the truth. You fight him with the word of God. You fight him with your faith. And this is going to be an ongoing battle. You cannot get complacent or think that because of what you know, you can be selective in your obedience to God. Because then, as we're going to see, Satan will have won. We're going to start this lesson off in Revelation, the 12th chapter. And again, the title is, Beware of Satan and his evil angels. And as a reminder, we're going to see what happened with Satan and his angels. We covered this last week, but it bears repeating. Here John warns us about Satan. 12, and pick it up at verse number 7. Revelation 12 and 7. You go ahead when you get there. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Go ahead and what happened? And prevailed not. Go ahead. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. So you got a battle that's taking place in heaven. And Michael and his angels are fighting Satan and his angels. Go ahead. We're going to see what happened with Satan and his angels. Go ahead. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. The various titles that applied to Satan. So you can find him in other places in the scripture. He's called the great dragon, that old serpent. He's called the devil, and again, Satan. And he is simply an angel. But he and his angels were cast out by Michael and his angels. What has Satan done? Go ahead. Which deceiveth the whole world. He didn't say a part of the world. He said he has deceived the whole world, and that he has. People talk about Satan. If you ask the average individual about Satan, they'll tell you, yeah, he's in hell roasting people. 
Satan is not in hell. Satan is on this earth and his whole objective is to send people to hell. He said he's deceived the whole world. Go ahead. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Drop down to verse number 12. Therefore what? Therefore rejoice ye heaven uh -huh. and ye that dwell in them. But what about the inhabitants of the earth? Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. He said woe to the people of the earth and why is that? For well, the devil has come down unto you. Go ahead. Having great wrath. And he is angry. Knowing what? Because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Because he knows the judgment that awaits him. You can read that in Matthew the 25th chapter. Because the lake of fire was prepared for Satan and his angels. But he is here on this earth. And it says he is what? Having. He is full of wrath. Pick it up at verse number 3. How many of them? Are right, here. Go ahead. There appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns. Go ahead. And seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. Now he just talked about the entire Gentile dynasty, but he said in his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. He's talking about saying not that he has a tail. He persuaded a third part of the angels. The angels, which it tells you there's an innumerable amount. He persuaded a third part of them to follow him. He caused them to get cast out of heaven along with himself. And they are here on this earth and as John said, they are full of wrath. Go ahead. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered. Go ahead. For to devour her child as soon as it was born. Turn over to 1 Peter, the fifth chapter. You got Satan in the third part of the angels here on the earth. As John said, Satan is full of wrath because he knoweth that his time is short. And Peter tells us exactly what it is that Satan is doing with the time that he has left. Peter warns us about Satan. What does he say? Verse number five, I'm sorry, First Peter five and verse number eight. What does he tell us to do? Be sober, be vigilant. He said, you gotta, you gotta watch and you gotta be alert. And why is that? Because your adversary the devil. So you have an enemy, talking about an angel, and you cannot even see him. He said, you be sober and be diligent because your adversary, the devil, go ahead, what is he doing? As a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He said, Satan is walking this earth and what he is doing, he is seeking those he can devour. So we have an enemy that is in the midst of us that we cannot see and his whole objective is to destroy man. Pick it up at verse number nine. What did Peter tell us to do? Go ahead. Who resist steadfast in the faith. He said, now you gotta resist him in the faith because it is your faith that you're going to use to combat Satan. As I stated, Satan is an extremely powerful being, but he cannot do anything to you that you don't allow to be done. We're going to see. Because again, his, his tactics are deception and temptation. If you don't accept the lie, if you don't succumb to the desires of your heart that are contrary to God, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that Satan can do to you. But make no mistake, he is on a rampage. He is here and he is seeking to destroy all he can. Those that don't even understand, he already has. The ones he is truly after are the ones that know the word of God, that are trying to serve him. But pick it up, go to Jude. Yeah, I finished that, thank you. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brother that are in the world. He's simply letting us on everybody is going through this. But turn over to Jude. Because as I said, 
Satan and his angels are here on the earth, and they are bent on man's destruction. And Jude tells us, again, what makes them so dangerous. And that is the fact that they are here, and you cannot even see them. You are fighting an enemy that cannot be saved. Jude 1 and verse number 6. Because they are here, but why is it that we can't see them? Jude's going to explain. Go ahead when you get there. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. Again, the Lord had Michael kick them out of heaven, did he not? Yes. He said, but the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, what? He hath reserved an everlasting change in the darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So they are here on this earth, but you cannot see them, as he said, they are under the chains of darkness. They cannot be seen, but they are wrecking much happy. Because we're going to see Satan is running this world. Turn over to John, the 14th chapter. Jesus lets us know that. Here he warns them, his disciples, because he knew he was getting ready to go back to be with the Father. And listen to what he told. 14, pick it up at verse number 28. Because he even told them, taught them how to pray. He said, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. He's talking about all evil, but especially this evil that was to come. Go ahead. Pick it up at John 14 and 28. Because what does he tell them? You have heard now I said unto you. Uh-huh. I go away and come again unto you. Again, he's coming back. He's going to be with the Father. Because once he was crucified, he raised from the dead. He is sitting at the right hand of the Father. He said, you've heard how I said unto you. I go away and come again unto you. Go ahead. If you loved me. He would rejoice. Uh -huh. As I said, what? I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Go ahead. And now I have told you before it come to pass. What? That when it is come to pass, ye might believe. He was repeatedly telling them what was to take the, what was to take place concerning himself. Because they were all looking for the Messiah. But they were looking for the Messiah to restore Israel. Politically. Jesus came at that time to restore Israel spiritually. He came to die for the sins of the world. But he kept telling them that he had to come and he had to die. And he was going to go back to be with the Father. And therefore what? Hereafter I will not talk much with you. Because what's going to take place? For the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Notice what he calls him. Mm -hmm. And he's referring to none other than Satan. He said the prince or the ruler of this world. He said, His, hereafter I will not talk much with you. He said, for the prince of this world coming and having nothing in me. Turn over to Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. Jesus called him the prince of this world. Let's see what Paul calls. And Paul's going to tell us what it is that Satan has done. Pick it up in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse number 3. Because Paul was about the God's business. He was preaching the gospel, the good news. But go ahead, 4 and 3. What did Paul say? <coughs> but if our gospel be here, what? It is here to them that are lost. Talking about those who are to perish because of their unbelief. He said, but if our gospel, talking about the good news, that God gave his only begotten son to die for the sins of the world. And not only did Jesus die, he was raised from the grave, paving the way for us to come back from death. He's going to establish an everlasting kingdom here on this earth and all that are obedient unto him. Well, they inheritance to that kingdom. That's the gospel. That's the good news. But it's lost to the majority of people. And why is that? Verse number four. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Notice what he called Satan. He called him the God of this world. Jesus called him the prince of this world. He is the ruler of this world because Satan is the dominant influence on this earth. 
Men are not following the word of God. All it says, I said, all you have to do to evidence that is to look at the actions of people. Even those that profess to believe in God, the majority of them, the majority of them do nothing what God has to say. What God has to say is in his word. It is not what comes out the mouth of another man that calls himself a preacher of the word of God. In order to be obedient to God, you have to be obedient to what thus says the Lord from Genesis to Revelation. Not what comes out of the mouth of a pastor or a minister or a preacher or so-called evangelist. If it does not line up with the word of God, then you are not being obedient unto God. So the majority of people, even those that call themselves Christians, followers of Christ, have blasphemed the word of God. Because nobody wants to be obedient to what thus said the Lord. Paul said, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, talking about Satan, again, he is the dominant influence, as evidenced by the actions of men. He has blinded the mind of them that they believe not. Go ahead. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, uh -huh. who is the image of God, should shine unto them. He's blinded them, at least that's the word of God will enlighten you. But turn over. The Luke, the fourth chapter. Because again, we're going to see that Satan is the one that's running this world. Luke 4. We're going to pick it up at verse number 5. Because this is the account of when Satan came and even tried to tempt Jesus. 4 and verse number 5. What did he do? Go ahead when you get there. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain. Then we read in Revelation, was that not one of his times? The old dragon, the serpent, the devil, Satan. He said, and the devil taking him up in a high mountain, talking about Jesus. What did he do? Showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And what was the purpose of that? Go ahead. The devil said unto him, What? All this power will I give thee. Why? And the glory of them. Why is that? Well, that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Satan has a job. And God gave him something to work with. He took Jesus, took him, he said the devil take him high up into a mountain and showed him not some of the kingdoms. He said he showed him all the kingdoms of the world, of the world, in a moment of time. And Satan said unto Jesus, All this power, all this authority will I give unto thee. And the glory of them. But that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I'll give it. Satan is running this world. He is in control of this world. Again, all you have to do is look at the actions of the people, be they religious, be they political, or just the average man on the street. Who is operating with thus said the Lord? Who is following the word of God? Nobody is. The majority of people are going the wrong way. The majority of people, as Jesus said, they're headed for destruction. Turn over to Revelation, the 13th chapter. Satan is in charge of the kingdoms of this world. That's why Jesus said, I pray not for this world. You don't pray for the world because the world is doomed for destruction because the world again is being influenced by Satan. He is running this. God, make no mistake, is in control. But right now, Satan is running. Revelation 13, because we're going to confirm that the governments of the world are getting their power from Satan. John told us the same thing, 13, and pick it up at verse number one. Go ahead when you get there. And I stood upon the sand of the sea. Go ahead. And so a beast rise up out of the sea. And the sea just represents people, and the beast just represents a kingdom. But go ahead. Having seven heads and ten horns. And what this is that John is getting ready to describe is the entire Gentile dynasty. 
He said he saw beasts rise and follow the sea and follow the people having seven heads and ten horns. Go ahead. And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Go ahead. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. Go ahead. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. What he's replicating is what took place in Daniel. This vision was given to Daniel also. And the kingdoms were represented by beasts. There were four. Four ruling Gentile kingdoms. It began with the Babylonians. It was represented by the lion. It was followed by the Medo-Persians, which was represented by the bear. It was followed by the Greeks, which was represented by a leopard. And it was followed by Rome, which was just a great and terrible beast. A beast that was so fierce that there was no animal in God's kingdom to use to represent this beast. Because unlike the other kingdoms, Rome was different. It just didn't destroy you physically. Rome had another element attached to it, which was religion, which they used to destroy you spiritually. But go ahead. And his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So what did he get? Where did these kingdoms and these kingdoms get their power from? From none other than Satan. That's why Daniel said in the ninth chapter, and the people of the prince shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. In 70 AD, Titus, a Roman general, came and leveled Jerusalem down to the ground, destroying the temple and the city of Jerusalem. But he called him the people of the prince. And the prince is none other than Satan. This is not just horrible, wild accusations. This is the Bible telling you what is taking place on this earth. It is, we're going to see, spiritual warfare. Right. And right now, Satan is winning. Because people are in a battle and don't even realize what's taking place. Look at the actions of men today. And what you find is people are operating with no constraint, no fear. And when you have no constraint and no fear, what you will do is unlimited. And that includes the wickedness that you are capable of performing. But turn over to 2 Samuel, the 23rd chapter. Because it says Satan gave Rome its authority. And that goes for the United States, the EU, does not matter. Didn't he say all the kingdoms of the world? All of them. 2 Samuel, the 23rd chapter. And to see that the leaders of the world are not operating in accordance to God's word, we're going to read what David, the king of Israel, the sweet psalmist, a prophet, had to say how a ruler or a leader should be. 2 Samuel 23rd. And pick it up at verse number one. And certainly, what it should not be is to oppress the poor. And when you look around, that's what you have wholesale. You have political leaders and what they are doing are what? Enacting laws that will enrich the rich and again suppress or oppress the poor. That is totally contrary to the word of God. But 23 and 1 and go ahead. Now these be the last words of David. Uh -huh. David, the son of Jesse, said, Go ahead. And the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel, said, Again, king of Israel, known as the sweet psalmist, and also a prophet. Because what happened? Go ahead. The spirit of the Lord spake by me. Talking about the Holy Ghost spake through him. Go ahead. And his word was in my tongue. Again, David was inspired by the Holy Ghost to speak the words of God. And what did he say? The God of Israel said. What? The rock of Israel spake to me. Go ahead. He that ruleth over men must be just. And do what? Ruling in the fear of God. And all you have to do again is simply look at the action of men. When you look at our leaders, be it national, be it state, be it local, be it worldwide, are they just men? No. 
Are they ruling justly amongst the people? Do they operate like they have the fear of God? Certainly not. You have legislation that's being enacted that's going to legalize in the eyes of men homosexuality. And I say in the eyes of men because in the eyes of God, it is an abomination and will always be an abomination. How can you legitimize something that God has deemed to be wicked and an abomination? Homosexuality will never be accepted by God. I don't care how many laws I enacted by men. And when men do that, what they're showing is, is that they have no understanding, none whatsoever concerning the word of God. Because they're not operating with God's spirit. They're operating, again, with the spirit of Satan. Turn over to Ephesians, the second chapter, and we're going to see what that spirit is. Paul is going to let us know. Ephesians 2 and verse number 1. Because we're going to see that Satan is behind all the wickedness that exists in the world. Oh, mind It is those that commit the wicked acts. They're responsible for it, but they're being influenced. By Satan. Two and one. Go ahead when you get there. And you hand he quickened. Talk about made alive. Go ahead. Who were dead in trespasses and sin. Talk about spiritually dead because we were under the penalty of, the, of death. Because the wages of sin is what? Death. Is death. And all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. All had death coming. But again, because of God's grace and his mercy. He sent Jesus to shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sin. And when you come up under the blood of Christ then all your past sins are forgiven you. And you are to walk. You are not to walk contrary to the Lord. You are to be obedient unto him. He said, and you has he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, because our world. We're in in time past, he walked according to the course of this world. Go ahead, because they were walking contrary to God, because this world is contrary to God. He said, where in in time past you walked according to the course of this world? According to what? According to the prince of the power of the air. Oh, talking about Satan. How does he have power of the air? You have people, you get random thoughts. Sometimes you don't know where the thought comes from. They're just popping your mind. But it's one thing about it. If it's contrary to God, you know it didn't come from God. And a thought is simply that, just a thought. Just something for you to reflect on. But you have the power over the thought. And if you get a thought, whatever it may be, that is contrary to God, then what you have to do is exercise your free will and make sure that you don't act on that thought. Sometimes you'll just be sitting, I'll speak for myself. Sometimes I'll just be sitting around and say, oh, I just, just get a feel, just get a thought. I'm going to go to the refrigerator and get me a pot. I'm going to go do something. That's a very innocent thought. But sometimes other thought may pop into my mind that I know I ain't got no business having in my mind. And so what do you have to do is you can't let that thought just sit there right. and fester. Because if you allow that to take place, eventually that thought is going to manifest itself. It will no longer be a thought. It will be sin. Mm -hmm. And you will have offended God. Now where the thought came from? Again, he calls him the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that do what? The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Again, all thoughts that are contrary to God are of Satan. And that's what is influencing the people of the world today. It is not the word of God. The majority of people, the Bible, no other book has been in print like the Bible. But yet and still, there is no other material that is so misunderstood. 
nobody, when I say nobody, the people that understand what's taking place is minuscule compared to the ignorance that exists in this world when it comes to the word of God. And again, as Paul said, Satan has blinded the people to the gospel, to the good news. Even people, as I stated, that call themselves serving God will not serve him in accordance to his word. And what they're doing is they're serving a man. If a man tells you that Sunday is the day that you are to worship God, and God said it should be the seventh day, that's the Sabbath, the rest of your have a holy convocation on that day, then who are you a servant to? If you have a holy convocation on the Sabbath, then you're a servant of God. But if you have a holy convocation on the Sabbath, on the Sunday, then you are a servant of that man. And make no mistake, a man cannot deliver you. A man cannot give you salvation. A man does not have a kingdom to put you in, nor a lake of fire to throw you in. That is all reserved unto God. He is the one who we're going to see. He is the one that you are to worship. But he said again, Satan is the one. He is, he said, where he said, in times past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the earth, the spirit that worketh working in the children of disobedience. And again, that's the spirit that is prevalent in the world today. Everybody is operating with, I'm gonna do whatever makes me feel good. Whatever I wanna do, that's what I'm gonna do. With no regard, no fear of God. People don't believe God. People don't believe that there is a God. But turn over to Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Because it matters not either what a man believes. Because the book tells you that the angels, they believe and they tremble. He's talking about the evil angels. They know it's a God. God had him kicked out of heaven. But man ain't got sense enough to even believe that there is a God. Ephesians 6 and verse number 10. Because Paul warned us about Satan and his evil angels. And again, he's going to tell us what it is that we need in order to combat them. 6 and verse number 10. What does Paul say? Finally, my brother. He said, from now on, do what? Be strong in the Lord. He said, you remain steadfast in the faith. And in what? And in the power of his might. Because understand this. Satan is running this world right now, but God is in control. As powerful as Satan is, he was created. By God. God is all powerful. He is in control, and as long as you do what you're supposed to, Satan cannot do absolutely nothing. All the power he has has been rendered ineffective, useless. The only power he has over you is you yourself. You determine what your faith is going to be. You determine where you're going to spend all of eternity. You have free will. God will not force you to do something you don't want to do. And certainly he ain't going to let Satan force you either. He can't do nothing to you. But understand, he is here and it is a battle. He said, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And therefore what? Put on the whole arm of God. He's telling us, you got you to gotta prepare yourself. Arm yourself. He said you put on the whole arm of God. He's telling you to garner you a shield of protection. Again, prepare yourself. He said put on the whole arm of God that you what? That ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Against the tactics of Satan. And his tactics are temptation and lies. And we're going to see that. But go ahead. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's a battle. It's a spiritual warfare. Go ahead. But against principalities. What? Against powers. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Again, Satan is running this world. He is the prince of this world, as Paul said, the God of this world. Go ahead. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. Go ahead. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Uh-huh. Because of this, 
You again, you got to prepare yourself. He said you got to take unto you the whole armor of God. Don't rely on your own devices. Don't lean on your own understanding. He said, wherefore take unto you the whole arm of God that you what? That ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. Uh-huh. Having done all to stand. Again, it's not easy. It's an ongoing battle. But you will be victorious. All you have to do is hold on to your faith. Believe in God. Trust in his word. And be obedient unto him. Not an easy task. But again. It is one that is doable. Somebody's going to get into God's kingdom. It might as well be you. Serve him. Believe in him. And he'll reward you accordingly. And Satan will have no power. There's nothing that he can do to you. But he said you got to take on the whole arm of God that you be able to withstand. In other words, if you do this, you'll be ready. You'll be able to deal with Satan and his tactics because they are going to come. And even when you overcome that one trial, he's coming back again. The book tells you resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But it's only going to be for a season because he's going to come back. But the one thing that you have going for you, you got the word of God. And as long as you are rooted in that, let him come. Come with me. You deal with it. But go ahead. Stand there for Uh-huh. Having your loins girt about with the truth. This is how you arm yourself. Go ahead. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. Again, you got to make sure that you do that which is right regardless of what others say or what others do. You got to walk this walk alone, if you will. This is your life. This is your salvation. And you got to live it accordingly. Don't be a follower of the crowd. You got to do what you know is right for you. Do what's right according to the word of God. There is safety in numbers. But salvation does not lie there. Salvation lies in the word of God. And sometimes it is a lonely journey. But the one thing that you know that you have on this journey, you have been accompanied by God and his word. And that's all you need. Go ahead, verse number 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Uh-huh. Above all, what? taking the shield of faith. You got to hold on to your belief again. But I say, when you are confronted with your midnight hour, sometimes you can't reach out and call nobody. But God and his word is always there. Your faith should always be there. And it's not, again, not always going to be easy. Sometimes things can happen that will shake a man to his core. But you got to believe. And you prepare yourself now. Not while you're in the midst of a battle. If you watch a, a heavyweight fight, the combatants didn't start training once they got in the ring. Because if that's the case, the one who just did that, he's going to get his head knocked off. They prepared themselves for that battle. You got to prepare yourself for the battle. And it's ongoing preparation. He said you have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith. Wherewith what? Wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Again, because if you believe that God can deliver you, does not matter. But Satan sends your way. You trust in the Lord. Go ahead. Finally, what? And take the helmet of salvation. Uh -huh. And the sword of the Spirit. Which is what? Which is the Word of God. That's what you are fighting with. You are fighting with the Word of God. And that's something that you always have with you. But the reason you have it with you is because you study it, you meditate it. It is not something that you just, it's not an exercise in just reading or I'm going to read the book so I can quote it back to somebody. No. You incorporate it in your life. It is something to be lived, not something to be memorized. You make it become a part 
of you so that you can grab onto it and embrace it. Because again, you are in a battle and you are going to need it. Sooner or later, it's going to come out and you need to be prepared. But how you deal with Satan, again, is with the truth, with the word of God. Jesus is going to show us that. Turn over to Matthew, the fourth chapter. Because the battle, say, you got to arm yourself with the word of God. Because I say, oh, say, beware of his tactics. And his tactics are temptations and lies. And that's what he does or uses to try to get people to go contrary to the Lord. Here, he's going to tempt Jesus. This is Matthew, the fourth chapter. We saw it in part when he offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. And why did he do that? Because he knows that Jesus is going to run this world. And he's telling Jesus, Jesus, you ain't got to wait. I'll give it to you now. But Jesus understood, why should I take something that's going to be temporary when I can have it forever? All I got to do is be patient and wait on the Lord. Because we had kept reading, Satan had told him, all you got to do is bow down and worship me. And what good is that going to do to you? What good for you? What good if you gain the whole world and lose your soul, lose your eternal existence? I don't care how good you can live in this life. The life ends for everybody. If you don't live until the second coming of the Lord, it is all temporary. You ain't taking nothing with you but your words. That's what's going to follow you. That's what you're going to be judged on. Pick it up at 4 and verse number 1. Jesus is going to show us how to deal with Satan. Go ahead. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Because he is none other as we're going to see. He's a tempter. Go ahead. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. What was? He was afterward in hunger. Again, Jesus was hungry. He was in need of food, was he not? Satan understands that. What does Satan tell him? Go ahead. And when the tempter came to him, he said. Notice what he called him. He called him the tempter, did he not? Right. Again, he tempts you, but he tempts you with your desire. Right. Go ahead. If thou be the son of God, what? command that these stones be made break. Again, so he's tempting him of that. And what he's called, what he wants Jesus to do is to use the power of God on something frivolous as turning some stone into bread. Jesus could have went out and got him some food. But Satan again is going to try him. He's going to tempt him. What did Jesus tell him? But he answered and said, What? It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. Well, you need food to sustain yourself. I understand that. But what do you even need more? Go ahead. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Again, that's what should be governing your life. That's the most important thing that there is. You need, again, food to sustain yourself, but you need the word of God, not just for the life to come, but how to live this life, because this life prepares you for the life to come. Go ahead, say name done. Fine. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city. Go ahead. And setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. And what? And saith unto him, What? Thou be the son of God, mm -hmm. cast thyself down. Why? For it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up. And that is written in Psalms, but go ahead. Lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. So Satan is showing you something. He said, I know the word of God. And now he's going to use the word of God, going to try to use the word of God against the one who gave it. What did Jesus tell him? Jesus said unto him, What? It is written again. What? Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Oh, God will deliver you, but don't be a fool. Right. Don't be talking about my God will save me. Jump up on, climb up on the tallest building you can find and fall off or jump off and say, I'm going to see if God going to deliver me. I wouldn't tempt the Lord in that manner. That's not the deliverance the salvation he's talking about. There was an old saying, it used to say, God protects fools and babies. Until I started reading the Bible, I thought that was true. <laughs> Look here, that's not the case. A fool is on his own. 
God does not absolve us of our actions because of our foolish ignorance. That is not the case. But go ahead. Again, the devil taking them up into an exceeding high mountain. Uh -huh. Showed them all the kingdoms of the world. What he tell? And the glory of them. And saith unto him, What? All these things will I give thee, and thou wilt fall down and worship me. That's what Satan is seeking. Yes. He wants to be God. He wants to receive the praise and the glory like God should. And his whole objective. Again, it destroy man. Is it get man to go contrary to God? And what did Jesus do? Then said Jesus unto him, Go ahead. Get thee hence, Satan. That's all he said. Just get behind me, Satan. It's that simple. Go ahead. For it is written, What? Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. And what? And him only shalt thou serve. Again, what did Jesus use to combat Satan with? Did he not just use the word of God? Go ahead. Then Verse the, number 11. Then the devil leaveth him. But you can read in another place it said and he left He left him, right? Tells you in another place he departed from it for a season. Because he coming back. Go ahead. Behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Turn over to James, the first chapter. You fight Satan with the word of God. As Paul called it. The sword of the spirit, you fighting with the word, and you need all of it. Turn over to James, the first chapter, because we're going to see. James is going to let you know again that what Satan tempts you with is your own desire. James 1, and pick it up at verse. Number 12. 1 and 12. You go ahead when you get there. Blessed is the man that endures temptation. Uh -huh. But when he is tried. And again, everybody's going to be tried. He said, and blessed is the one that endures temptation. He said, because when he is tried, what's going to happen? He shall receive the crown of life. Go ahead. Which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Again, what did Jesus say? He that endured to the end shall be saved. You gotta endure it all. The persecution, the temptation. You gotta endure the afflictions. It's gonna be a difficult life. And you gotta hold on to your faith. And if you do that, then you'll have a crown of life. I'm talking about eternal life. That God is going to give all those and keep his command. But go ahead. Let no man say when he is tempted. He said, let no man say when he is enticed to do wrong that what? I am tempted of God. He said, look, don't believe that. Sometimes people will say some things and they let you know that they lack some understanding. They'll be in a situation and they're in a situation because of their own wrongdoing. And then say, well, see, God brought me here. They might be incarcerated and say, God brought me here. No, no, no. Your actions brought you there. Your way of thinking brought you there. God ain't brought you. Why would God need to bring you to prison to do what? Mm -mm. You can't lay that on God. Again, God is not going to entice you to do wrong. Ever. He said, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Because what? For God cannot be tempted with evil. It's not possible. Go ahead. Neither tempted he any man. But what? But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Because you are tempted by who? you tempted by the tempter. But what he's tempting you with is your own lust, your own desires. Those things that are contrary unto the Lord. Satan knows your thoughts. He told you in Ezekiel he's wiser than Daniel. He knows what you desire. Just like he knew Jesus was hungry and he tempted him in that fashion, in that manner. That's where he's going to come at you at. In places where he feels that you are weak. And you have to understand that. 
He said, but let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, because God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. Again, it's not possible. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. It's your own desires that will get you in trouble. It's like easy could have titled this, Beware of Satan and his evil angels, who are spirits and also the evil spirits that are within because your thoughts are spirits. And those thoughts that are contrary to God, those are evil spirits. And Satan will use that against you. But go ahead, verse number five. Because what happens if you give in to those desires, if you give in to the temptation? Go ahead. 15. Then when lust hath conceived. Go ahead. It bringeth forth sin. And what about sin? And sin, when it is finished. Bring it forth to death. He said, look, when lust has conceived, when it manifests itself into actions, that's sin. And sin, the wages of sin is death. But turn over to John, the eighth chapter. Because Jesus tells us another tactic that Satan uses outside of tempt or temptation. John 8 and verse number 37. Because he's going to let you know that Satan is a liar and a father of it. And we're going to see again how he conveys his lives is through God works through men. Satan works through men also. But he is the prince of the power of the air. And sometimes it's just random thoughts. And that's why Paul said, you got to try the spirit to see if they be of God or not. And it's real easy. If it don't line up with the book, then you know it's not of God. It's that simple. John 8 and verse number 37. But it becomes hard because people don't want to read the book. And even if they read the book, then they don't want to believe what's in the book. So if you're not going to believe the word of God, what are you going to believe? What are you going to put your faith in? Because everybody's got it. Everybody's got an opinion. An opinion is a dime a dozen. Everybody's got an opinion, but ain't nobody got no solutions. The only solution is the truth. That's the only thing that matters. I care less what people think. I've always been a little odd that way. But I'm thankful that I had that a part of my makeup, as a part of my being, that I don't have to follow the crowd. Because again, that can sometimes get you in serious trouble. John 8, and verse number 37. What did I, Jesus say to these people? I know that ye are Abraham's seed. Well, what? But ye seek to kill me. And why is that? Because my word hath no place in you. Now this is the Messiah, the anointed one. This is God in the flesh. He said he came to his own and his own rejected him. They were seeking to kill Jesus. And who were the ringleaders among them? The religious people. Who certainly should have known better. But he said, I know that you Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me. And the reason is because my word has no place in you. He tells you another place in John, talking about his disciples. I gave them, my, gave them talk, talking about what he did concerning the word of the Father. He said, I gave them my word, and the world has hated them. And the reason the world hates you because of the word of God, because if you are living in accordance to the word of God, you are contrary to the world. And you convict them because they see in you what they're supposed to be doing. And you dare would try to do it. You would dare to stand there and tell somebody, hey, this is wrong according to what does say the Lord going to come a time, like right now, it's not, you're not receiving real, true persecution for what you believe. Your family members might come against you and say, what you're dealing with, that, that's cultish, or why would you believe? Nobody literally believes the Bible. What's wrong with you? You might get some of that, but it's going to come a time when you physically are going to be abused for the word of God. And all you got to do is look at the client. And we might talk about that. Look at the climate of today. Somebody will say something about homosexuality and they will be 
totally, they'll come against them as if they were the one doing wrong because they said something about it. You cannot legislate morality. I don't care how many laws you put on the book that says it is right, wrong is wrong, it will always be wrong. But what man wants to do, he wants to take that which is evil and turn it into good. Talk about God made me this way. God wants you to love everybody. Not so. You are the way you are because that's how you choose to be. You got free will. That's what God gave us. We choose what we want to do. We choose what we want to be. And no matter how many people choose to do wrong and enact laws to make it seem right, it's always going to be wrong. Always. But he said, I know you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. And if you got the word of God in you, the world's going to be against you. But go ahead. I speak that which I have seen with my father. Go ahead. And you do that which ye have seen with your father. Talking about the spiritual father. He's going to let him know he's talking about none other than Satan. Go ahead. Then I answered and said unto him, uh -huh. Abraham was our father. Well, Jesus said unto them, What did he tell them? If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. Uh -huh. But now ye seek to kill me. Go ahead. The man that hath told you the truth. What? That I have heard of God. This did, not Abraham. Again, he said, if you're the children of Abraham, then evidence. Do the works of Abraham. If you say you got faith, then evidence. With your actions, by being obedient to the commandments of God. As he said in another place, if you love me, then keep my commandments. It's not enough just to profess that you love God. You got evidence. He said, and he said, he told him, I speak that which I've seen with my father, and you do that which you've seen with your father. Again, their spiritual father, he's talking about. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. But he told them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. He said, but you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth. And people, people do not want to be told what thus say the Lord. People do not want to be told the truth, even when they are dead wrong. They don't want you bringing the truth to them. They will turn and turn on you. But you know what? It don't matter. I have to tell people what does say the Lord. I'm wired that way. That's what's in me. I don't really care. My whole objective is I don't want to offend nobody. But in the telling of truth, if it's offensive to a person, that's them and their problem. That's them and their offense. As long as what I'm saying lines up with thus say the Lord, I'm going to tell it. It was like Jeremiah said. I'm not trying to be dramatic. It's in me. I can't shut it up. I can't put a lid on it. I have to tell what is right. And that goes back to when I was a little kid. I was a snitch in the, in the classroom. Teacher Lee, people acting up. Teacher, let me tell you, this one over here was doing wrong. This one, man, I'm going to get you. Yeah, but I was a teacher's pet. Because I would tell they ain't doing wrong. It was in me. So this is not a stretch for me. And how people react to me really don't matter. But go ahead. Because this ain't about me. Go ahead. 41. Ye do the deeds of your father. Uh huh. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. And again, he's going to tell them something going, What is that? Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, what? He would love me. Again, if we truly are servants of God, then we're going to do the things of God. We're going to love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our might. And we're going to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. It's all that simple. And we're not going to make excuses. We're not going to be selective in the things that we do. We're not going to be selective in the commandments that we follow. We're going to be obedient to the word. 
the whole word. Go ahead. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Go ahead. Why do ye not understand my speech? Uh -huh. Even because ye cannot hear my word. Why is that? Ye are of your father the devil. Talking about you got the same mindset, not saying that Satan birthed some people. It's impossible. He said, but you are you of your father, the devil. You have the same mindset. Go ahead. And the lust of your father, ye will do. The desires of your father, you'll do. And what, how was their father? What was their father? He was a murderer from the beginning. Go ahead. And abode not in the truth. And why is that? Because there is no truth in him. Again, he saw about Satan. He said he was a murderer from the beginning because he murdered the whole creation. That's his whole objective. It's to destroy mankind. He said, you are of your father the devil and the lust of your father. Yeah, I'm sorry, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. Go ahead. When he speaketh a lie. What? He speaketh of his own. Because that's his nature. What is he? Well, he is a liar Go and ahead. the father of it. Satan is a tempter and he is a liar. And those are his tactics. That's why God hates lying. It tells you in Proverbs there are six things that the Lord hates and seven are abomination. A proud look and a lying tongue. He cannot stand lying because lying is a device of sin. Turn over to Genesis, the third chapter. Because we've seen that he is a tempter and he is a liar. We're going to see him put those tactics into practice because God had told Adam not to deal with this being because in Genesis the second chapter it told you he formed man from the dust of the ground breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul he took that man and placed him in the garden of Eden where he had made all the trees that were good for food and also in the midst of the garden was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he told the man, of all the trees I can freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, do not eat of that tree. For on the day that you do, thou shalt surely die. So what God showed us then was that when he created this man, this man that was made in his likeness and in his image, he gave him free will. He gave man the choice. You decide. Nobody's going to force you. He tells you the consequences, though, of your choices. And he said, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now the tree, which is not a literal tree, it's an allegory, is simply talking about Satan, because Ezekiel tells you that Satan, he was in the garden of Eden. And the Lord told this man, stay away from him. He warned him, just like John warned us about Satan, just like Peter warned us about Satan, just like Paul warned us about Satan, Jesus warned us about Satan. That warning started here in the garden with Adam. Adam did not heed the warning. And how did Satan get to him? Pick it up, Genesis 3 and verse number 1. Go ahead when you get there. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Was that not one of the titles of Satan? So we know here. He said, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And what did this serpent, serpent do? Go ahead. And he said unto the woman. Now you don't have no talking snakes. This is Satan. Go ahead. He told the woman what? Yeah. Had God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And it's always said, you be prepared. You ready yourself. Because you ain't got to go looking for trouble. Trouble is going to come and find you. Mm -hmm. It's not enough locks on your doors to keep trouble away. Trouble is going to come knocking when you least expect it. But you be ready for it. He said, he said unto the woman, yea, had God said ye should not eat of every tree of the garden. What is the woman going to tell him? Go ahead. And the woman said unto the serpent. Go ahead. He may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But well, what about this one tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, 
God hath said, What? Ye shall not eat it of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Did she know? She knew exactly what the Lord said concerning this. It was commanded to her, her, her and Adam, do not eat of this tree. Don't deal with this angel. Go ahead. But God doth know that it, and the serpent said unto the woman, What did he tell her? Ye shall not surely die. First thing he told her was a lie. He said, no, you're not going to. You, look, you can deal with me. You're not going to die. Then what did he do? Go ahead. God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, uh -huh. and your eyes shall be opened. And what you going to be? And ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil. He mixed in a lie with the truth, which is still what? Nothing but an unadulterated lie. I don't care how much truth you put on top of a lie, you still got a lie at the foundation. You have these people, what they call equivocators, people who manipulate their speech, saying one thing and prying another. So I tell my wife, I'm not sophisticated. A man just a liar. That's all it is to it. You can call him an equivocator. You can call him subtle. You can call him whatever you want. It's a lie. When you, when you, when you shake it all down, it is what it is. It's a lie. But go ahead. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. And what? And that it was pleasant to the eye. Go ahead. And the tree to be desired to make one wise. So Satan appealed to her desire to have some wisdom. He told her a lie. Appealed to her desire. Tempted her with those things. And what did she do? She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. She disobeyed God. Go ahead and did, did what? Gave also unto her husband. And what did he do? With her and he did eat. He did the same thing. Now we're going to find out Eve did what she did because she was deceived. But what was Adam's case? He just went along with the program. He just went along with the crowd. It's like they say, old day, old school. You do something stupid, your parents tell you, look, boy, if somebody tells you to jump off a bridge, you're going to do that too? All Adam was supposed to do was say, hey, look, no. God said don't do this. But he dealt with Satan. She was deceived. Again, he just went willingly. But go ahead. It said, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and ate of it and gave it to her husband and he did eat. You have people talking about, oh, this was some apples that ate from a, from a tree. Turn over to Hosea. We're coming right back. Turn to Hosea, the 10th chapter. Hosea's going to tell us what we ate, what they ate. What did Jesus say about Satan? He was a liar and the father of it. The first lie he told was, you're not going to die. Hosea is going to tell us what this fruit was that they ate from this tree. Hosea 10 and 1 verse. 10 and 13. What is the fruit that they ate? Go ahead. You have plowed wickedness. Uh -huh. You have reaped iniquity. What? You have eaten the fruit of life. That's what they ate from that tree. Because we're going to see they got some information, some bad information from Satan. Oh, he told them some truth. You're going to be like God. You're going to know good and evil. But the lie, you're not going to die. That information they got is not going to do them no good in the grave. He said, you proud you wickedness, you freak the iniquity, you've eaten the fruit of lies. Go ahead. Because thou didst trust in thy way. What? In the multitude of thy mighty men. They trusted in others more than they trusted in the Lord. In the case of Adam and Eve, they trusted in Satan. Other than what does say the Lord. That's the, that's the, if anything, you feel sorry for people. As clear as it is, it is right there in the book. They got so many excuses, so many reasons why they don't need to follow. But it's just going to bring about destruction. Turn back to Genesis, the third chapter. Because we're going to see what happens 
as a result of them eating this fruit. Go ahead. 3 and verse number 7. Genesis 3 and 7. What took place after they ate this fruit? After they dealt with Satan. Because there's nothing you can eat off a tree that's going to give you some information. 3 and 7. Go ahead. And the eyes of them both were open. Uh -huh. And they knew that they were naked. Go ahead. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves equal. They consumed some information. So Isaiah said they ate the fruit of life. He told them something about their anatomy. There's no fruit you can eat that tells you anything. Go ahead. Verse, Verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Again, this is none other than Jesus. He's the only God that matters no. Go ahead. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Again, show your man is not too bright. How you gonna hide from God? He created the universe, created the heavens and the earth and all that there is therein. And you're gonna try to hide yourself amongst the tree. But go ahead. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, uh -huh. Where art thou? Go ahead. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And what does he say? And I was afraid. Uh -huh. Because I was naked and I hid myself. What did the Lord say? Go ahead. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Again, that's how they got the information, because somebody told them, and that somebody was none other than Satan. And the Lord had told them, Don't deal with this being. He said, He hid himself. From the Lord, he said, because I was afraid that being Adam, because I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And the Lord said, who told you that thou was naked? Have you done what? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Well, I like, commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat. Trees don't talk. Serpents don't talk. This is referencing none other than Satan. Just like the tree of life. They could have ate from the tree of life, and that would have gave them what? Life, eternal life. And the tree that they would have had to eat from represented none other than Jesus. What do you say? My words, they are spirit. And they are life. They are life. You consume the word of God. You abide by it. And you'll attain eternal life. Go ahead. Verse 12. What did he tell the man? I'm sorry. Verse 12. Go ahead. And the man said, uh -huh. The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. Now the excuses start. So the man turned around and he blames Eve. And there's one thing we're going to see. There are no excuses with God. He said, the, woman, the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, he thought he was slick. Because God had made the woman to be a help me for the man. He said, the woman that, that you gave to me, that's, she gave, hey, that was the problem. She gave me of the tree. But he messed up with this other part. And I did eat. You're totally responsible for the things that you do. Irregardless of the source of your problem. If you, if you give in to it, you become the problem. You own that problem. If somebody brings you some foolishness, it is just that somebody's foolishness that they brought to you. But when you take that foolishness and act on it, now it becomes your foolishness. So it's Adam's foolishness now. Ain't got nothing to do with Eve. We like to play these games amongst ourselves. Well, a woman, she ain't no good. She did this. No. A man's supposed to be a man, and a woman's supposed to be a woman. Both of them are supposed to be righteous in the eyes of God. Right. What a woman's fault. Adam did what he did. It was Adam's fault. Go ahead. And the Lord God said unto the woman, uh -huh. What is this that thou hast done? And what did the woman do? Because she got an excuse to go ahead. And the woman said, What? The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Did it say Satan has deceived the whole world? Yes. His deception started back here with Eve. He, she said, The Lord God said, to the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent, being Satan, he deceived me, and therefore I ate. Go ahead. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, uh -huh. because thou hast done this, what? thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. And what's going to happen? Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And that's what he's done. Mm -hmm. Walking in the earth. Seeking whom we may devour. Man was made from the dust of the ground. And Satan's whole objective 
It's to devour him some dust. It's to destroy man. But pick it up at verse number 16. Read that. It's not on the thing, but read that. What did he say to the woman? Because we're going to see if her excuse was good enough to get back. Go ahead. But to the woman, he said, uh -huh. I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. He's talking about, I'm going to increase your pain during childbirth. And any woman that has had a child will tell you about that pain. How incredible. That, how, how painful it is. It did not have to be. But the Lord said to the woman, he said, I'm going to greatly multiply your sorrow and thy conception and sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children. Go ahead. And thy desire shall be to thy husband. What? And he shall rule over thee. You're going to want to be the head. That's going to be your desire. But the order is, the man is to be in charge. That is the way God has set it up. And understand this, anytime you go contrary to the word of God, nothing can come out of that. Nothing positive can come of that. If you go contrary to the word of God, all you have to do is look at what does say the Lord. And look at what happens when people go contrary to it. It's not going to come to any good. It cannot be. You cannot be happy in that situation because that is not how God set it up. But go ahead, what about that? And unto Adam he said, What? Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife uh -huh. and hast eaten of the tree. Because you allowed your wife to influence you to do wrong and you did wrong, you not own that foolishness and I'm going to punish you too. Go ahead. Of which I commanded thee saying, what? Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Go ahead. And so shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Again, you going to have a hard life. This does not sound like prosperity as we keep on reading. Come to the Lord and everything's going to be all right and all. You're going to have a hard life and at the end of it, you are going to die. And that is the norm. And people, a little older, and you said, man, I'm glad to be here. Why? Because it's been a tough road. It's been a battle. And I look at young people today, and I say, I don't know how they're going to make it. Because they've made things so difficult for people just to survive, just to get the necessities in life. Everybody should have a right to work. Everybody should have a right to raise a family. First commandment God gave man was to be fruitful and to multiply. And he gave him the covenant of marriage in which to do that under. A man and a wife are supposed to produce an offspring. Not a man and a man. Or a woman and a woman. The only thing they can produce is some confusion. A man and a man, a man and his wife are supposed to produce an offspring. You're supposed to be able to provide for your family. You're supposed to be able to have a place to live. You're supposed to have the necessities in life, such as food and water. But when I say you talk about the wickedness of man, Jesus said something. He said, the poor you're going to always have with you. When you examine that, why, do we all, why are we going to always have the poor with us? Because of the wickedness of man. Not that God cannot provide enough. It's just that you're going to have those that are going to be trying to hoard the resources unto themselves and utilize it for themselves. But go ahead. He said, you're going to have a, and he said, curse this ground for thy sake and sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of thy life. 18. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. And what's going to happen? Till thou return unto the ground. And why is that? For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and not to dust shalt thou return. And going back to the dust of the ground. But drop down to verse number 22. Just read that. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us. To do what? To know good and evil. So Satan did. Tell him some truth did. But it didn't matter. Because where were they destined to go? Back to the dust of the ground. He mixed in some truth with a lie. And it cost them their life. He said, the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Therefore, what? 
And now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Man, it was not God's intentions for man to die. Man brought that upon himself by listening to a lie and believing it over the word of God. God had not intended for man to die. But since that's what man wanted, they wanted to believe what Satan had to say, God will give you what you believe. If you want to believe a lie, you say, here, here, here. You got free will. Satan didn't take Adam and Eve and twist them around their neck and do nothing to them physically. Just appeal to her desire to have some wisdom. And simply threw in a lie to make it sound palatable, to make it even more appealing. So she took the temptation that he laid before her, mixed in with the lie. She consumed that and turned around and said, hey, Adam, you want some of this? And he just being boo-booed or who, he went right along with it. Y'all know who boo-boo is. He went right along with it. But again, he owns that. She owns it. Just like each and every one of us, we own our foolishness. If something comes to you, be it by way of a person, be it by way of a thought, if it's contrary to God, you cannot act upon that. Because when you act upon it, it is no longer a thought. It manifested itself into sin. Now you own that. And there's a price to pay for that. Turn over to 2 Corinthians 11 chapter. Because Satan can't just pop up like he did with Adam and Eve. Jesus had to be tempted in every way, so he had to show himself unto Jesus. But we see in Jude told us they've been saying that his angels are under the chains of darkness. So how is he getting unto men? How is he conveying his lies unto men? It is through other men. Just like God works through men, Satan has men that he works through also. And Paul warns us about him here. 11 and verse number 1. Because what Satan does is he influences men through his ministers. And that sounds, that sounds, to be honest, that sounds crazy. To say that Satan has ministers, all oh, the majority of people that are out here call themselves preaching the word of God are not of God. God didn't send them. Church in Jeremiah, I didn't send them those prophets, but yet they ran. I didn't speak, but yes, they spoke. Talking about what does say the Lord, but nothing what they say lines up with the word of God. And it's real simple. God is not going to send you nobody that's going to teach you contrary to the word of God. If a man calls himself a minister or a man of God and he's teaching you that which does not line up with the word of God, then he is not a man of God. He is one of what Paul is warning us about here. He's a minister of Satan. 11 and 1, he warned the Corinthians. Concerning this. Go ahead. What are you tell? Would to God he could bear with me a little in my fault. He said, just allow me this and put up with me. Go ahead. And indeed bear with me. Go ahead. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. Uh-huh. For I have espoused you to one husband. He said, I betrothed you to one husband that I may what? That I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He said, I want to present you as being pure unto the Lord. So there's no such thing as you're saying. You are on a journey to salvation. And at any point in time, you can get lost. And believe me, Satan is there trying to pluck you off. The rest of the world, he ain't worried about them. He already got them in his back pocket. But it's his concern over them. They are already contrary to the Lord. So what are you going to put your resources and your efforts into? The ones that are trying to get away. Go ahead. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. Just as he deceived, he said, I'm afraid that just as Satan deceived Eve through his craftiness, so what? So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Again, go break the law and suffer the consequences. Go ahead. For he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached. Again, how can that be another Jesus? It's real simple. Because you're going to have those that's coming with the name of Jesus, but they're not going to bring the doctrine. See, the Jesus that people worship on Sunday, 
And I'm not being flipped, but that's another Jesus. Mm -hmm. The Jesus that died on Good Friday and rose early Sunday morning, that's another Jesus. Mm -hmm. He told him when he asked him a sign that he was the Christ, the only sign he gave was just like Jonah was in the heart of the in the belly of the well for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. That's the only sign that you know that he's a Christ. And then you have ministers that will teach you. He died on Good Friday and rose early Sunday morning. That is a lie. And that is a lie that is perpetrated by who? By Satan's ministers, these false prophets. And the reason being, see, because when you believe that, as innocent as it may be, and people will say when you're explaining that to them, they say, well, see, I'm doing it in the spirit. Or like when they say, well, we're observing Christmas. You can't find Jesus' birthday nowhere in the Bible. That didn't come about until over 300 years after he had died. The thing he told us to do, observe the Passover. Mm -hmm. He said, this do in remembrance of me. They'll tell you, well, you got to do these things in the spirit. But when you do that, what you are doing is you are denying Jesus. And if you deny him now, he's going to deny you in front of the Father, the angels. But go ahead. He said, for if he cometh that preaches another Jesus, whom we've not preached, go ahead. Or if he receive another spirit. Go ahead. Which he have not received. Or another what? Or another gospel. Like you going to heaven. Mm -hmm. Nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere can you find in one inkling of a place where it says you going to heaven. They try to use the place and they're real crafty. They say, well, Jesus say, well, uh, I go to prepare a place for you. They don't read the rest of it. But he say, if I go, I'm going to come again to receive you until myself. Come again well, back to this earth. But they leave that part off, knowing that people don't read the book. So they can tell them lies. They can fool. The easiest thing to do is to fool a person with the word of God. Because either they've not read the book, or they just say, well, i got to see what my pastor say. Go ahead. Which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Drop down to verse number 13. Because who are these for ministers that's going to come preaching another Jesus? For such are false apostles. Go ahead. Deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. He said they're false apostles, deceitful workers. They're doing the bidding of their father. They're doing the same thing that Satan did, deceiving people. He said, these are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no what? And no more. Why? For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore what? Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. They appear to be righteous, but they're deceitful, lying people. That's what they are. And they're lying in the name of God. And they're doing it for a purpose. They're doing it, as they say, for filthy lucre, to get paid. That's what it's all about. Has nothing to do with salvation. Ain't got nothing to do with it. They could care less about the word of God. Could care less about the word of God. You got one of big time, I ain't calling no name, big time minister just got caught in a scandal with Involved with homosexuality. Then you got another false prophet talking about the people don't need a church. Why? This man's got God's anointing on him. Give me a break. Mm -hmm. I know, how are you going to sit up there? And then you got the foolish people, and I call them what they are. Foolish people still sit there. Why? Because they sheep. And sheep just follow the leader. But you can't be sheep. You gotta think for yourself. Right? You can't let nobody lead you down or lead you astray down a path because where you are headed, if the person you are following is not truly a man of God, you are headed towards damnation. It's that simple. I'm the last one to want to condemn somebody to hell because Jesus said, 
all judgment has been given unto me. I don't know when nobody's going to end up. I don't know who's going to end up in the fire or who's going to end up in the kingdom when it comes to individuals. What I do know is that what does say the Lord. If you do these things and do these things willfully, then you're going to end up either in the kingdom by being obedient to God or in the lake of fire by breaking his commandments. But you got these ministers that will tell you, these ministers of Satan, first and foremost, the commandments have been done away with. You ain't got to keep the commandments. And what did Jesus tell the man when he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said, keep the commandments. And then a minister will tell you, you ain't got to keep the commandments. They've been done away with. Well, in doing away with God's commandments, he's doing away with a person's salvation. One lie after another. Got people celebrate. I did the same thing. What has Christmas got to do with Jesus? Or Easter? Absolutely nothing. But if you tell people about the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or if you talk to them about the memorial of the blowing of the trumpets, great feast that God has gave unto men of great significance because they outlined God's plan of salvation for men and people don't have a clue and will look at you cross out and say something's wrong they try to keep them feasts for the Jews I don't understand it only thing that they had inherited was a pack of lives that's the bottom line but go ahead he said, therefore it's no great thing if the ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness. Whose end is going to be what? Whose end shall be according to their work. They're going in the lake of fire, but unfortunately the people that they persuade and deceive are going to follow them. Turn over to 1 Kings, the 22nd chapter. 1 Kings, 22nd chapter. Because Satan will try to influence you. He uses again your desires. And lies. He'll use your thoughts and he'll use others to pass his lives on to you. 22. And pick it up at verse number one. We're going to see a case in this. This is Ahab, a wicked king. And Ahab wants to take back some of the land that the Syrians had took from him. So he's going to try to join forces with Jehoshaphat, who is a good king, which shows you you have to be mindful who it is you associate yourself with. Right. 22 and 1. And go ahead when you get there. And they continue three years without war between Syria and Israel. Again, because Syria has some land that belongs to Israel, and Ahab want this, wants this land back. Go ahead. And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. Because the kingdom had been split into two. You had the southern kingdom, which was by the name of Judah. Jehoshaphat ruled over it, ruled over it. And you had the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, which was Retain the name of Israel. And Ahab was the king of it. Go ahead. Verse 3. And the king of Israel said unto his servants. Uh-huh. Know ye that Ramoth Gilead is ours? And we be still and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria. So he wanted this land back. Go ahead. And he said unto Jehoshaphat. What? Wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? Uh-huh. And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel. What? I am as thou art. They all Israelites. Go ahead. I am people as thy people. Uh -huh. My horses as thy horses. If, even though be that as it is, always be mindful who you associate with. Right. Go ahead. Right. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel. What? This is the most important thing. In court, Whatever you got to do, you take it to the Lord. And Jehoshaphat say, hey, we need to inquire of the Lord today concerning this. Go ahead. Inquire, I pray thee. Uh -huh. The word of the Lord today. Ask the Lord concerning this. Go ahead. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together. How many? About 400 men. Uh huh. And said unto them. He got 400. Go ahead and he's going to inquire of the Lord as to whether or not they should go up to Red Mount Gilead. Say the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said unto him, Should I go up against Red Mount Gilead to battle, or should I what? Or shall I forbid? Go ahead and what did they say? And they said, Go on, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And these were not God's prophets. And for whatever reason, Jehoshaphat thought something was going on. 
Something didn't seem right to me. And what did he say? And Jehoshaphat said, What? Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides? He said, Look here, Duty, you got another prophet around here besides these 400? Something didn't seem right to him. That we might what? That we might inquire of him. And what did Ahab tell him? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, What? There is yet one man. What's his name? Micaiah, the son of Imla. Uh huh. By whom we may inquire of the Lord. But how does Ahab feel about this man? But I hate him. And why? For he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. He said, look, it's another man of God here, but I hate him. Why? Because he lies to you? No, because he don't prophesy nothing good of me, only evil. He only tell me what does say the Lord. Right. And people will hate you for telling them yes. what does say the Lord. They want you to pro they want you to prophesy smooth things unto them. Prophesy deceit unto me. Tell me some lies. They'll swallow a lot much quicker than they will the truth. But go ahead. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. Uh -huh. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, hasten hither Micaiah the son of Imlah. So they go go get Micaiah now. These 400 people, these 400 prophets and told them, go on up to Ramoth Gilead. Drop down to verse number, drop down to verse number 13 because we're going to see what Micaiah's answer is going to be. Go ahead. And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, uh -huh. Behold, now the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. So they, 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 they telling him, they prepping him. This is what you need to do, Micaiah. Now, he said, the, as it, it, he said, the messenger that was gone unto him said, Behold, the words of the prophets they didn't declare good unto the king. They all all on one accord. Let what? Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them. What? And speak that which is good. In other words, go along with this, Micaiah. We all say good concerning this man. You go along with it. As I said, being a servant of God sometimes is a lonely journey. Sometimes you got to go against the crowd. But you got to have the strength to do that. That's not always easy, but it's the best. Go ahead. What Micaiah tell you? And Micaiah said, What? As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. And that's what the true servant of God is going to do. It does not matter what the crowd say. Does not matter the opposition that he will run into. You got 400 men saying one thing, and Micaiah saying, as the Lord liveth, what the Lord said unto me, that will I speak. That's the only thing that's going to persuade me. Not what somebody else say over here or somebody else say over here. I can care less. It is not even what I think. It is what thus say the Lord. Go ahead. So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, uh -huh. Micaiah, what? shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle? Well, shall we forbear? And what did Micaiah tell? And he answered him, Go up and prosper. Uh -huh. For the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And the king knew Micaiah was messing with him. What did he say? And the king said unto him, uh -huh. How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? Again, he knew that Micaiah was true and his other prophets were wrong. Mm -hmm. But what was that play here? was his own desire. Right. He wanted that land from the Syrians. And he felt that if he joined forces with Jehoshaphat, that he could take it. He knew the men were lying to him. But they were telling him what he wanted to hear. And so he's going to go along with that, even though Micaiah is going to tell him something different. But go ahead, 17. And he said, What? I saw all Israel scattered upon the hill. Go ahead. As sheep that have not a shepherd. Uh huh. And the Lord said, These have no master. Now, mind you, he's telling this to Ahab. Ahab is their master. Mm -hmm. He said, Look, I saw all of Israel and they scattered upon the hills as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Therefore, what? 
Let them return every man to his house in peace. In other words, something's going to happen to their leader. Something's going to happen to their shepherd or their master. Go ahead, what did they have said? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, uh -huh. Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? But notice what he did not say about Micaiah. He didn't say he was lying, did he? Right. He said, but didn't I tell you he ain't going to tell me nothing but evil? He can't tell him nothing but evil because he was an evil, wicked king. Right. That's all you have coming. People want to do wrong, but they don't want to be told of the wrong that they're doing. And flip the script and put it back on you. It doesn't matter. They don't have to like what you're saying. All that matters is if you're telling them the truth. That's what matters. And he told him the truth. But his desire is going to outweigh the truth to his detriment. But go ahead. 19. And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. Uh -huh, he's going to tell them something that took place. Go ahead. And all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. Uh-huh, talk about the angels. Go ahead. And the Lord said, What? Who shall pursue Ahab? Because it's time for Ahab to be taken out. Go ahead. That he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead. Because again, he's getting ready to get rid of Ahab. And he said, Who's going to persuade Ahab that he should go on and go up to Ramoth Gilead? Because that's going to be his demise. Go ahead. And one said on this matter. Uh -huh. And another said on that matter. And, there, and, and therefore came what? And there came forth a spirit. Uh -huh. And stood before the Lord. Go ahead. And said, I will persuade And this is an evil angel. And he is here on this earth. And he stood before the Lord and said, I persuade. I persuade Ahab to go up to Raymond Gilead where he's going to fall. And the Lord's going to ask him, how you going to do that? Go ahead. And the Lord said unto him. Where with? How you going to do that? And the angels going to tell him how. Go ahead. And he said, I will go forth. And do what? And I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Go ahead. And he said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. The angel said, look, I go forth and I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his 400 men. The Lord told him, go ahead. You're going to do that. Because Ahab, he knew, wanted to believe a lie. And so this angel put the thought of this lie in the mind of 400 men. They all was on one accord. Go up. Go up to Red Mount Gilead. Because the Lord is with you. Yeah, but the Lord is with them. And not for his good, for his demise. But go ahead. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets. And the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. He said again, and Micaiah is telling him what's taking place. He said he's 400. The Lord had put a lying spirit in the mouth of these men. And how did he do that? It was by way of an evil angel. Just put the thought in their mind, and they ran back and told Ahab, yeah, go on up. The Lord is with you. Pick it up at verse number 24. But Zedekiah, the son of Shedaniah, Went near and smote Micaiah on the cheek and said, What? Which way went the Spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? So he said that Micaiah is lying. Mm -hmm. But out of all of them, he was the only one that was telling the truth. And Ahab did go up. And he tried to be slick about it. Because he convinced Jehoshaphat to change clothes with him. And so he went up. And the Syrians said, In the battle, only fight with one person. And that's Ahab. So they was after Jehoshaphat because they thought he was the king of Israel because of his attire. And he cried out. And they stopped pursuing after him. But a man by chance just drew a bow and shot and killed Ahab because it was his time. Why? Because he chose to listen to 400 lying people over the net or the word of God's prophet. And again, how was he done in? By his desire and a lie. And who was behind it all? None but Satan and his evil angels. Turn over to Job. Because we're going to look at another example 
of how Satan will come at you. You're going to see another example of how a person's thought is being influenced by Satan. Anything that is contrary to the word of God is not of God. And you don't have to worry about nothing. What you have to worry about is making sure you don't succumb to some foolishness. One and one. Go ahead when you get there. Job one and one. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright. And one that feared God and eschewed evil. Read verse number two because we want to see Job was a prosperous man. Job was a righteous man and an upright man. And God is the one. It said these things about Job. Not another man. But go ahead. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His quiver was full of children. Go ahead. And he had great substance. His, go ahead. His substance also was seven thousand sheep and three thousand camels and five hundred yoke of oxen and five hundred she asses and a very great household. So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. Drop down to verse number six, and we're going to see what took place with Job. Go ahead. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. These are the holy angels, and who came with them? And Satan came also among them. Where is Satan at? Satan's on the earth, right? We just read what Micaiah told us of a thing taking place. The host of heaven was on his right hand and on his left hand. Besides him, those are the holy angels. God is in control of all things. Yes. Satan is running this world, but it's only temporary. Tell the Lord, say, it's time. Just like he had Michael kick him out of heaven, he's going to have Michael deal with Satan again. But this time, where he's going to is a lake of fire. But it said there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came because he's no longer a son of God. He's been disinherited. Go ahead. What did the Lord tell Satan? And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Uh-huh. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, And this is what he said. Go ahead. From going to and fro on the earth. Oh, I'm in hell, torment people. No, he said from going to and fro on the earth. Doing what? Seeking whom he may devour, as Peter said. Go ahead. And from walking up and down in it. Go ahead. And the Lord said unto Satan, Uh-huh. Hast thou considered my servant Job? Go ahead. That there is none like him in the earth. A perfect and an upright man. He's a just and a righteous man. And again, these accolades are not coming from another man. This is God talking about Job. He said, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth. A perfect and an upright man. One that does what? One that feareth God and assureth evil. Go ahead. And Satan answered the Lord and said, What? Does the Job fear God for nothing? He said, look, you have made him prosperous. That's why he's serving you. Go ahead. Hast not thou made an hedge about him? Your protection is around him. Go ahead. And about his house. Uh -huh. And about all that he hath on every side. And has done what? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands. Go ahead. And his substance is increased in the land. So again, Job, Satan is taking the position that Job is serving God because Job is prospering. Has nothing to do with that. We're going to see that. Go ahead. Yeah, keep going. Verse number uh, 10. I'm sorry, verse number 11. But put forth thine hand now. And do what? And touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Again, Satan's purpose is to get Job to denounce God, is it not? Right. He said, look, and if you put forth your hand and touch all that he has, I'm telling you, he will curse you to your, curse you to your face. Verse number 12. Go ahead. And the Lord said unto Satan, uh -huh. Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Go ahead. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. Go ahead. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So God is in control of this situation, is he not? Yes. He's allowing Satan. But even telling Satan, you can only do so much. Right. You go ahead. We're going we're gonna to go ahead and try Job this way. I don't allow this to take place. You get at it. But what he tell him? He say, but upon him, don't put your hand on him now, Satan. But everything else, open season. Keep reading. 13. I'm sorry, Rock. Pick it up. Pick it up at verse number 14. Because we're going to see what happened with Job and all the possessions that he had. 14. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, uh -huh. The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them 
and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only have escaped along to tell them. Go ahead, because the bad news keeps coming. Go ahead. While he was yet speaking, there came also another. And uh -huh. said, the fire of God has fallen from heaven. What? And have burned up the sheep and his servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell. Go ahead. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the heirs of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell. So he's lost all of his possessions. But keep going, because it's only going to get worse. While Amen. he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, uh -huh. Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And what happened? And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness, and smote the four corners of thy house. Uh -huh. And it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. Go ahead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Now truly, Job has done something seriously wrong, has he? Now, he had to have offended God for all this to befall him, has he not? But then we just read what God said. Job was a perfect and an upright man. So I'm pointing this out because sometimes people will look at circumstances that happen to other people and make assessments that they have no clue about. Mm -hmm. And that is wrong. That's unjust judgment. That's what Job's friends did to Job. They came to console him and condemn Job. Say, your children had to be doing something wrong, Job. That's why they did. You had to have done something, Job. You probably were oppressing the poor or wasn't helping the, the, the widow or the fatherless, Job. That's where all this tragedy befell you. No, it befell Job because Job was a righteous servant of God God understood that Job could pass the test. Even before he had allowed Satan to get him, he knew what Job was about. Job faltered a little bit because Job wanted to, to show himself to be right and ended up condemning God. And God dealt with him on that matter. But the thing is, things happen sometimes because they just happen. But go ahead. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. With all this that had befallen him, what did he do? He fell on his knees and he worshipped. That's what a true servant of God does. When the Lord took the son of David and Bathsheba, and David had been fasting and laying upon the ground all that night, God struck the child. They came and told David what had taken place. He had perceived by the actions that the child was dead. Say, David got up, cleaned himself off, anointed himself, and went into the house of the Lord. And he prayed unto God. It does not matter what goes on around you. You got to hold on to your faith and your trust in the Lord. All this had befallen Job. And what did it say? Job ran his mantle, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground, and he worshipped. And what did he say? And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb. True. And naked shall I return thither. That's true also. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. What? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Go ahead. And all this Job sin not, nor charged God foolish. See, people talk about always the patience of Job. Job was a wise man, and he showed his wisdom. In all of his pain and anguish, what did he do? He understood all that he had came from God. So who is he to question God if he took it away? He said, blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job said not nor charged God foolishly. He continued in his service and worship unto the Lord. Go right into the second chapter. Because again, Satan's whole objective was to do what? Was to get Job to denounce God. And now he's going to come at him at another, from another angle. He's going to use another source to plant the seed. Do him what and go ahead. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Uh -huh. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Go ahead. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, 
from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down. Look at whom I'm looking for whom I may devour. Nothing's changed. That's his light and life. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? Now there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feared God and eschewed the evil. And still he holdeth fast his integrity, uh -huh. although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. Again, God allowed this to happen. He's the one that's in control. But go ahead. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin what? for skin. Go ahead. Hey, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But go ahead. But put forth thine hand now, uh -huh. and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. Satan is saying, look, if you allow Job to suffer physically, then he'll curse you. Go ahead. And the Lord said unto Satan, What? Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. And again, notice, he's placing limits on Satan. He said, he, he in your hand, but you can't take his life now. Go ahead. So when Satan fell from the presence of the Lord, what he do? and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. So Job now has been afflicted with some kind of ailment. Go ahead. And he took him a potter to scrape himself with him. Uh -huh. And he sat down among the ashes. And his wife is going to come to him to console him. But listen to what she says to him. Go ahead. Then said his wife unto him, uh -huh. Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Again, she's discouraged because of what has been taking place. When Job lost his wealth, she lost her wealth. Uh -huh. When he lost them ten kids, she lost her ten kids. And she said to him, Does thou still retain thine integrity? Do what? Curse God and die. Is that not what Satan said? Right. Exact same thing. So he just put the thoughts into her mind and she just conveyed that thought unto Job. Well, what did Job tell him? Go ahead. But he said unto her, uh -huh. Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaking. You're speaking like a foolish person. Same thing that Adam should have said. Yes. When he enticed him, he said, hey, you foolish man, go on up. But Job had more wisdom. He said, you speak as a foolish woman speaking. Go ahead. What? Shall we receive God good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? Go ahead. And all this did not Job sin with his lips. And again, that's the key. You hold on to your faith. Irregardless of the circumstances. Irregardless of what anybody brings you. You know what is right and you know what is wrong. Denounce that which is wrong. Hold on to that which is right and you keep going. Turn over to James, the fourth chapter. Because again, you don't have to worry about Satan and his angels because they can't force you to do nothing you don't want to do. They entice you. With your desires. They don't force you to do nothing. They don't have that right. God didn't force you to do anything. They're not going to force you. They're not going to force you to do nothing. James is going to tell you how to deal with Satan. Four and seven. And go ahead when you get there. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Be faithful to him. Be obedient unto him. And do what? Resist the devil. And what will he do? And he will flee from you. He'll flee from you. But it's only going to be for a moment. It's only going to be for a season. He's coming back. But go ahead. Draw nigh to God. And what? And he will draw nigh to you. He'll protect you. Go ahead. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. And what? And purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Again, you cannot profess to be believers of God and be disobedient. To his, and not be obedient to his word. You got to do one or the other. If you're going to serve him, just serve him in word. You got to serve him in deed also. Turn over to Matthew, the 15th chapter. Because as I say, it's some more evil spirits that we have to concern ourselves with. Satan is out there and his angels, but we also harbor evil spirits and that's our thoughts and Jesus told us about those here 10 and pick it up at verse I'm sorry Matthew 15 and pick it up at verse number 10 
Because these people have been concerned with man's traditions, the washings of hand before they ate. And Jesus is dealing with them. Because what's most important is being obedient to the word of God. Oh yeah, you should be. It's good to be sanitary. I would hope that everybody would wash their hand before they ate. But they were more concerned with man's traditions than being obedient to God's commandments. And that's why he told them. I tell you what, pick it up at, start at verse number nine. What did he tell them? But in vain they do worship me. Doing what? Teaching for the doctors the commandments of men. He said, look, you're worshiping me for nothing. Because your worship of me is based on the commandments of men and not the commandments of God. Go ahead. And he called the multitude and said unto them, uh -huh. Hear and understand. What? Not that which goeth into the mouth and defileth they man. Is he talking about the dietary law? Of course not. Go ahead. But that, gonna tell you. but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth the man. Drop down the first number. Drop down the first number 15 and go ahead. Because Peter, and that's the thing. When you want to know something, you don't understand as God. And he'll reveal it to you. Go ahead. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this pair. What? And Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? But still, he's going to turn around and answer. Right. Go ahead. Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the drum? Just cast it out. Go ahead. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart. From the mind. Go ahead. And they defile the man. And how is that? For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. Go ahead. Murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. All those things that are contrary unto God. That comes forth from a man's mind. You got to eradicate those evil spirits also. You got to be where those evil spirits. Because sometimes it is those desires that are contrary to God that Satan will play on. That will cause a man to do wrong. Turn over to Luke, the 22nd chapter, and we're going to see an example of that. I say we use our thoughts for desires that, that are contrary to God against us. Luke 22. Pick it up at verse number 1. 22 and 1. You go ahead when you get there. Now, this is talking about sorry, Luke 22 and 1. We're going to see what Judas does. Here Judas was a disciple. He had been with Jesus for three and a half years. Seeing the miracles and such. He knew the power of God. Profess. You can't get no closer. Go ahead. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew nigh. Uh -huh. It was called the Passover. Go ahead. And the chief priest and scribes sought how they might kill him. Mm -hmm. For they feared the people. Because they knew Jesus was a prophet. But again, the religious people wanted to kill Jesus. Go ahead. And then what happened? Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot. And again, Satan is an angel. How does an angel enter into a man? Again, it's just your thoughts. It said, then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And what did he do? And he went his way. Go ahead. And knew with the chief priests and captains. How he might what? How he might betray him unto them. Again, because Judas was a thief. Yes. And Satan put it in the mind of Judas to betray Jesus for some filthy lucre. Turn over to John the 13th chapter. And we're going to see how Satan entered into Judas. Go ahead, 13 and 1. Because John's giving the same account of what we just read about, but then he's going to add something else to it. And that's how, you, that's how you let the Bible explain itself. You don't have to interpret it. Just let it interpret itself. Here a little and there a little. Let each witness tell you about the subject of the matter that you're searching out. Go ahead, 13 and 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world unto the Father. Now he said before the feast of the Passover, the feast of the Passover, what he's talking about is the feast of unleavened bread, what we just got to read in Martin Luke. He said when Jesus knew that his time was up, 
because he was going to die on the Passover. He's the Passover lamb. He said that his hour was come that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Having done what? Having loved his own which were in the world. Go ahead. Loved him unto the end. And what happened? And supper being ended. Go ahead. The devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Again, Satan just put the thought in Judas' mind to betray him because Judas knew he was going to get paid for 30 pieces of silver that had been prophesied of by Zechariah. He was going to betray him for 30 pieces of silver. Again, he walked with Jesus. Witness the power of God. But the evil spirits that were within him, he couldn't eradicate. And Satan used that against Jews. But turn over to Matthew, the 16th chapter. Because see, it doesn't have to be something as insidious or so, as what one would claim so serious. Going all walking around harboring thoughts of murder and and being a thief. It's mostly on the man mind of men these days of fornicating and having a good time. But it's just as bad when you have a man all dressed up in his nice suit and his family and he's carting them off to church and it's on Sunday. That's an evil thought in his mind. God never sanctioned. Sunday, the first day of the week. He never told man to have holy convocation on that day. The man is supposed to be the spiritual leader of his household. That man is contrary to the Lord. So much of what people do today is contrary to the Lord. All why? Because they're being influenced not by God, but by Satan. But 16 and 13, because we're going to find Every thought that is contrary, every thought that is contrary to God is of Satan. Now here, the Lord is asking his disciples, who do people say that he is? Go ahead when you get there, 16 and 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Uh -huh. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some Elias and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But he's going to continue asking. Go ahead. He said unto them, But whom say he that I am? And now Peter's going to tell him. What did Peter say? Go ahead. And Simon Peter answered and said, What? Thou art the Christ. Go ahead. The Son of the living God. He said, You the Messiah. You the anointed one. You are the Son of God. Go ahead. What did Jesus tell him? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Uh huh. Blessed art thou, Simon Bashon. Why? For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. So he acknowledged to Peter that what Peter had said was correct. He said, you blessed, Peter, because flesh and blood ain't done this. That's not revealed this unto thee. But how did he know? Go ahead. But my Father which is in heaven. He said, but my Father has revealed this unto you. And that was done through the Holy Ghost. But I'm not dealing with that right now. Drop down to verse number. <laughs> Step down to verse number 20. Because he had just told Peter how blessed he was. How that the Father had revealed unto him. As to that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the anointed. He was the Christ. 20 and go ahead. Then Charles see his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. And then Jesus is going to go and continue to tell them what he had been trying to let them know. That he was going to have to be killed. Go ahead. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chiefs, priests, and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. And again, what did Peter tell him? Because they thought he was supposed to restore Israel, to restore the kingdom at that time. So Peter's going to take him and admonish him. Go ahead. Then Peter took him uh -huh. and began to rebuke him. The same one that Jesus had just told how blessed he was. He said, Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying what? Saying, be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. He said, this is not going to happen. Peter didn't mean any harm. Peter did not want him to die. But not understanding if Jesus didn't come and die, 
if he didn't come and do the will of the Father, then we would all still be under our sin. Mm -hmm. Then Satan would have won. Right. The whole creation would have been lost. But what did Jesus tell Peter? Go ahead. 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, uh -huh. Get thee behind me, Satan. Go ahead. Thou art an offense unto me. He said, he told Peter, notice what he, what he called him. He said, get behind me, Satan. He said, you are an offense to me. Why did he call him Satan? Go ahead. For thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of me. Because your desire is not in line with God, it is in line with that of men. Anything that is contrary to God is of Satan. Turn over to 1 Samuel, the 10th chapter. And we have to understand, because God has been merciful. Bless you with a lot of knowledge and understanding. Make sure you get the wisdom to go with it. Because at no point should you think because of the knowledge that you have that you could be selective in your obedience to God. You got to obey him throughout it all. You got to do all of it. The same God that said that you would have a holy convocation on the seventh day of the week. Same God that told you what is clean and unclean is the same God that told you you gotta be forgiven. The same God that told you you gotta be merciful. Same God that told you that you gotta love your neighbor as you love yourself. So you gotta do it all. Not just some. But pick it up at 1 Samuel 10. And we're gonna see what happened to an individual who had God's spirit but because of their refusal to be obedient, lost him. 10 in verse number 1, because this is when Samuel's going to receive God's spirit. 10 and 1, go ahead when you get there. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? He's going to make him king over Israel. Go ahead. When thou art departed from me today, uh -huh. and thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulchre in the border of Benjamin and Zelza, and they will say unto thee, The asses which thou wentest to seek are found. And lo, thy father hath left the care of the asses, and saw with for you, saying, What shall I do for my son? Go ahead. Then shalt thou go on forward from thence. Because he's telling him the sign of what's going to take place to show. Samuel's telling him what's going to take place to show that God truly has chosen him. He's going to be king. And God's going to do something else for him. He's going to change his spirit. He's going to change his mindset. But go ahead. And thou shalt come to the plain of Tabor. And there shall meet thee three men going up to God to Bethlehem. One carrying three kids and another carrying three loaves of bread and another carrying a bottle of wine. Go ahead. What they going to tell you? They will salute thee and give thee two loaves of bread which thou shalt receive of their hand. Uh -huh. After that thou shalt come to the hill of God where is the garrison of the Philistines and it shall come to pass when thou art come thither to the city that thou shalt keep, meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a sultry and a tavern and a pipe and a harp before them and they shall prophesy. And when these signs take place, then what's going to occur? And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon me. He said, you're going to receive God's Spirit. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. A different mindset. Go ahead. And thou shalt prophesy with them. And be what? And shalt be turned into another man. Go ahead. And let it be. When these signs are come unto thee, uh -huh. and thou do as occasion serve thee. As occasion demands what? For God is with thee. You got to be obedient. Drop down to verse number nine. Go ahead. And it was so. And what happened? And when he had turned his back to go from Samuel. What? God gave him another heart. Instantly, the Lord gave him a different mindset. At that time, go ahead. And all those signs came to pass that day. Verse number 10. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him. And the Spirit of God came upon him. And he prophesied among them. So he received God's spirit just like Samuel said he would. But go to the 16th chapter. Because unfortunately Saul was disobedient unto the Lord. And God would not allow his spirit to retain in a man that is not going to follow him. So what is going to take place? God's spirit is going to leave Saul and Satan's spirit. 
it's going to take you more. 16 and verse number 1. Because again, Saul had been disobedient. The Lord told him to kill the Amalekites and everybody. Kill man, woman, children, the beast of the field. Samuel came unto Saul. And Saul said, I've done it. Well, thus say the Lord. Samuel said, well, then why do I hear the bleeding of these sheep? Why do I hear the noise of the herd if you've killed everything like you were supposed to? He said, well, the people wanted to make a sacrifice unto the Lord. Samuel told him, obedience is better than sacrifice. He had left the king Agag alive. Mm -hmm. Samuel took him and slew him, killed him. Saul refused to be obedient. And as a result of that, again, the Lord's going to take his spirit back. 16 and 1, and go ahead. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul? Uh -huh. Saying, I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. He was through with Saul. Go ahead. Fill thine horn with oil. Uh -huh. and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided me a king among his sons. And again, this man was picked by God to be the first king of Israel, the first man to rule over his people. Ain't no such thing as predestined. Ain't no such thing as we special. The only thing special is to know the word of God and to do it. That's real special. But go ahead. And Samuel said, how can I go? Because what will Saul do? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. This is telling you how far Saul has fallen, how far his mind has gotten messed up. He had the mind of God, and now he, is, he would be willing to kill a servant of God. Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hear about it, he's going to kill me. What did the Lord tell him? And the Lord said, take an heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. Go ahead. And call Jesse to the sacrifice. Because he's going to provide another king, a son of Jesse, talking about David. But go ahead. And I will show thee what thou shalt do. Uh -huh. Thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. Drop down to verse number 13. And go ahead. Then Samuel, what happened? Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brother. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So, so Samuel rose up and went to him up. Go ahead. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. He took his head away from around Saul, which left him naked. And Satan is just walking around, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. And he's going to Saul is all messed up. He said, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit, an evil angel from the Lord troubled him. Go ahead. And Saul's servant said unto him, What? Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubling thee. Again, you cannot be compliant or complacent. You just cannot think because you got some knowledge, you are special. Saul was anointed king of Israel. God gave him his spirit then. And Saul rejected it through his disobedience, and the Lord took it away. God is not a respecter of person. And again, who Satan really wants? Turn over to Luke, the 22nd chapter, and this is it. The ones that's in the world and they don't have a clue, don't even know the battle is taking place, they are already his victim. It's the ones that are trying to serve the Lord. That's what we want, and that's what the Lord is Telling Peter that here, he's going to tell Peter what he needs in order to withstand Satan. And it's simple. Just stand on your faith. You hold on. There's nothing Satan can do to you. 22 and verse number 31. What did the Lord say here? What did he tell Peter? Go ahead. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon. What? Behold, Satan hath desire to have that he may what? That he may sift you as we. He wants to destroy you, Peter. Satan desires you. Peter was a disciple of Jesus. Satan wants you, Peter. He told him, he said, Simon, Simon, Peter, Peter, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as we. But what did Jesus say? Go ahead. But I have prayed for thee. Notice he didn't say, I didn't say Satan don't deal with it. You can't mess with it. 
No, he said, I pray for you, Peter, that what? That thy faith fail not. Uh huh. When thou art converted. Because Peter's faith did fail. Because Peter denied Jesus. But he's showing us also, if you fall, don't lay there and squalor. Get back up. Repent. Ask for God's mercy and continue to go forward. He said, Peter, Simon has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. He said, but I prayed for you that your faith don't fail you. Because that's what you need to stand on. The word of God, all of it. That's how you combat Satan is with the truth. He said, and when you are converted, Peter, because Peter regained his faith. He said, then you do what? Then you strengthen your brother. Again, you're trying to serve God, you're in a spiritual battle. And I say trying to serve him, those that are truly trying to be obedient to his commandments, as they are written in this book, everybody confess to, to serve the true living God. But you have what you need to be victorious, and that's your faith, that's your belief. You just got to hold on it, stand on it, and endure until the end. And there's nothing Satan can do to you. And that's the way of Satan and his evil angels. I want to thank you for your time.